Welcome to the Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor. Now, here's your host, Tom Lindquist. Glad to have you back in the Leadership Lyceum, where we bring you direct access to top CEOs and directors of boards in an interview format that provides insight on situational issues that confront CEOs every day. It is a CEO's virtual mentor. Welcome to episode 22 and May 2019, which marks our three-year anniversary of publishing a CEO's virtual mentor. I'd like to express our special thanks to the clients of Lyceum Leadership Consulting that have enabled us to bring you this podcast and to you, ladies and gentlemen, our devoted listenership for your continued encouragement and programming suggestions. Today, I'm joined by Talon Energy's CEO, Ralph Alexander, and CFO, Alex Hernandez. We'll be discussing the remarkable turnaround of Talon Energy that Ralph and Alex have been presiding over. We'll be right back to jump into the program. I'm here in the Talon Energy headquarters, just north of Houston, Texas, in the Woodlands, and it's always a pleasant experience to come down from Chicago in February and be in the warmer climes. It's my pleasure to be hosted here by my guests in the podcast, Talon Energy's CEO, Ralph Alexander, and CFO, Alex Hernandez. Thank you both for having me in today. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I should add that I had the pleasure of both invitation and attendance last week in New York City at Talon's Excellent Investor Day, which we'll talk more about in the program. In fact, your New York investor trip was so successful, I think, that we postponed this to do it here in Houston at your headquarters instead. I'm just delighted to be here after that experience also last week. Talon Energy in its privately held form today is unique, and its evolution to its current state illustrates the range of leadership activities available for a company in a take-private setting. There's a definite before, middle, and beyond to the take-private transformation, and Talon is still in the early stage of the beyond era. The red letter date of the Take Private was December 6, 2016. And to set context, we have to back up a little bit. And about a year and a half before the Take Private, Talon Energy was formed when Pennsylvania Power and Light, or PPL, spun off their power generation assets and combined them with those belonging to private equity group Riverstone. The company was listed on the New York Stock Exchange on June 1, 2015 with initial ownership being 65% PPL and 35% Riverstone. That company, which I think you all refer to as Talon 1.0, had about 15,000 megawatts of capacity split across fuel sources with about 43% from natural gas, 40% from coal, and 15% from nuclear, with that being one nuclear facility, And those assets sold into two major wholesale markets in ERCOT, PJM, and plus, I think, a small amount in New England as well. Talon generated a pro forma of $4.3 billion in 2014 revenues. On December 6, 2016, Riverstone purchased the remaining 65% of Talon, making Talon a privately held company and appointed you both to lead the company. You both faced a massive task in sorting out what you had, but backing up before that, what were the expectations and requirements that Riverstone had for not only the company, but for you both as a management team? Ralph, I'll I'll start with you. So I was a partner at the time when uh, Talon was formed and was asked to join the board of the public company. And we were quite excited about this combination because it had the scale and the reach that I think had the potential to be make it a quite competitive enterprise. Unfortunately, over the 18 months of its public life, the market began to deteriorate a bit, to be honest. I mean, it wasn't just Talon, but other companies in the sector were struggling a little bit. People were still searching for a different strategic approach to it. You had guys beginning to buy retail companies. You had people betting the farm on gas only. 
Here's a little background and context on the retail and gas front. On the retail front, you have NRG and Vistra Energy. In February of 2018, an activist influence strategy saw NRG sell most of its renewable portfolio to global infrastructure partners. Its overall generation portfolio has been reduced by more than half over the last couple of years through asset sales. NRG now intends to focus on growth of their retail business organically and through acquisitions. Vistra is pursuing a diversification of holdings across generation and retail since emerging from the Energy Future Holdings bankruptcy in 2016. As a result of an acquisition in February of 2019, it is the largest residential electric power provider in the U.S. based on number of customers. On the gas front, you have Calpine. In March of 2018, a consortium of private equity investors led by Energy Capital Partners took Calpine, the largest generator of electricity from natural gas and geothermal resources, private. You know, this world of low-cost gas in perpetuity was a, a strategy that was being pushed. And the talent management sort of got caught up in that, in a way, and began to look at a strategic approach, which is essentially reshape the portfolio through acquisitions. And they looked at dozens and dozens of acquisitions. They did one that wasn't particularly successful, wanted to do another one, and that one we blocked as a 35% shareholder. Just didn't think it was the right Which one was that, Ralph? I call it Acquisition 2, which we didn't make public. It was actually acquired by another company who no longer exists, and that would have happened the same with us had we done it. So at that point, we decided, you know, public companies cannot have a major shareholder in dissonance with the management team. So... um, we needed to break the logjam. Either they take us out, we buy them out, and we ended up buying them out. At that time, this was really about preserving whatever was left of that company. There was a real possibility, in our view, that the company would have been worth zero. And like I said at the investor conference, we might have had this meeting the same day last week, except those bondholders would have been there as equity holders <laughs> had we not intervened. But what were the decisions that got the company there? What were the factors that were leading to that state? So the stock price had gone from $20 down to 6 It was trading at, my gosh, an EBITDA multiple, low single digits. And it was buying assets at double digits, high double digits. That doesn't work. You know, it just, just flat out doesn't work. So had they done the bigger acquisition, we would have doubled the amount of debt. We would have, on a bet, that gas prices were going up. And that was a bet Riverstone was not prepared to take. It's not because Riverstone is clairvoyant on gas prices. It's because Riverstone is one of the largest energy investors in private equity. I spent my career in upstream oil and gas. We knew that costs were coming down. We knew that the Marcellus and Utica were going crazy, that the Permian was coming. So why people had a different view, in our view, was pie in the sky. So that's how we blocked it. Honestly, had we done it with that amount of debt, we would not be having this interview. Very interesting. And so... It was clear then the investment thesis for Riverstone. Save what we have Uh and then see what we got. I frankly was pretty uncomfortable with what we paid for the company. I thought it was too much based on what I saw as a board member. We had a problematic nuclear plant that was under incredible scrutiny from the outside regulatory groups. We had plants that were not running well in many cases. We had, you know, and Alex can talk about this, a debt maturity tower that was staring us right in the face with a declining trajectory. All these things coming together is a recipe for a disaster. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, every other IPP in this industry, Calpine, Dynagy, Vistra, NRG have all gone bankrupt. It's a low bar. We haven't done that, nor do we intend to do it. But everybody made the bets that we were making again as the public company that ended up in disaster. And we decided to step in and fix that. For clarity's sake, Vistra did not go bankrupt. It was a predecessor company, Energy Future Holdings, that went bankrupt. Vistra emerged from that bankruptcy in 2016. We'll be right back to discuss the components of the fix. We left for break with Ralph mentioning the trail of corporate failures that was paved by low gas prices. So in the midst of all this, why go deeper? Why double down? Here's CFO Alex Hernandez. The irony of the M&A strategy was that 
after looking as a public company at external M&A for two years, you know, ironically, and Ralph, you express it this way, is that the best acquisition was ourselves. Mm -hmm. The best acquisition was talent itself. And if we could fix all the internal issues that we saw from the outside, that might be an acquisition that could work, not because of the commodity price bet that Ralph mentioned, but rather because of execution and liberating the potential of a firm that wasn't achieving its full potential. Well, I think that's what's most interesting is you could only anticipate a certain amount because you could only see so much at that time. And now looking back, it's, it's much easier. But how did you get a sense of what opportunities there were inside from your vantage point in December of 2016? Well, it's interesting. You know, Riverstone had owned a portion of these assets for some period of time. We had a sense of what was possible across the fossil fleet, just from simple knowledge of operating the assets, simple benchmarking and what we had done before and benchmarking across the industry. And that led us from the outside in before stepping in as managers of the firm to conclude that there might be, you know, $125 million of opportunity annually inside of Talon that was not being captured. And that was a studied, analyzed analysis, but from the outside in. What we actually discovered over the course of a year and two is that that number soon became 350, it soon became 475, and we crossed 600 last year and now are exceeding $600 million over that two year period for a company of talent size, which has been quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. And so the surprise was not that opportunities existed to operate the plants better, to lower the cost structure, to expand the firm's potential, but what we underestimated, and it wasn't a conservative estimate at the time, was just the degree to which we could achieve improvements and the speed at which we could achieve improvements. And I think, it, you know, to me, the takeaway as a leader, strategically, is do I bet on the commodity? There's no doubt if power prices double tomorrow, or gas prices go to 6 or $7 at MCF, we're making so much money we can't count it. Unfortunately, I can't control that. But there are guys who sit there and go, we're betting on the commodity, let's play for the commodity. What I can control is if I'm the low-cost guy, which is generally true in any industry you're in, you survive, and you still get the upside potential. So our model was get the cost base to where it needs to get to, and if the commodity comes our way, great, but we're sure as hell aren't gonna depend on that. That's an upside to what we're doing, where the previous guys were much more interested in predicting the commodity price. So how does a leader lead the costs out and the efficiencies into the business through others? Part of the leadership recipe is when you come in new or running a business, you've got to paint the situation in a way that people haven't seen before. I call it unfreezing. You've got to put something in the room where they sit there and go, gee, I didn't know that, or aha, uh -huh, that's a different way to think about the business. So we laid out where did we need to get to to compete because we were not competitive. Then we said, here's the team. Then we said, here are the new rules. Here's your authorities, which we delegated. And then we measured. We have these things called PRMs, in the monthly performance reviews. They are as much about changing the culture, getting people to understand what we want to do, providing a good challenge. Hey, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? I will tell you, in my view, the reason Susquehanna will be the best plant in the country from where it was in the third quartile is to me the single biggest reason is we told them they would do that. We just said, you will be the best plant in the country. And had we not declared that, I don't think we'd be there. So that team is going after it. And we helped them, we brought them support, we helped things that they didn't think they could do. And that's management's job. Set direction, boundaries, measure it, intervene both ways. Mm -hmm. so you have trouble, then how do I help you? You need more help, you're ahead of the curve, great. And that, that worked out pretty well. And Alex, you're bringing clarity so that the number that they had to hit. Sure. Well, there, you know, there's, there's a long preparation period before we could actually quantify what was possible. And I'd say between the time of the closing of the Take Private in June to December 2016, we got to know a lot of people at the company. So that the first day we began, we began with a relationship that existed as opposed to beginning from scratch. And then between December and the spring of that following year, we then expanded that effort to get to know virtually everybody at the company. And so step one was building trust so that the information that was flowing was accurate, substantive, deep enough that we could use it to reforecast what was possible in the business. And so Ralph and I did, in that period of time, more than 100 in town halls across the firm 
I think we met every single employee at nearly every single plant multiple times, sometimes in large groups, sometimes in small groups, sometimes individually. But until that trust was starting to be formed, it would be impossible to get information about how the assets are performing, how the people are performing, what the risks are that we can't see. And really that laid the groundwork to then quantify. But I think we could not have done it without getting to know people individually first so that they would volunteer what they view was possible. We could begin to have a conversation about what we might envision too. And where did that come from, the knowing that you needed to get to know people? I've run a lot of businesses around the place, and there's no, especially when you, when you need to change the culture, where your chief commercial officer, who's managing a billion and a half dollars of gross margin, comes into my office in town's headquarters, like the fifth day on the job for me, and asks me if this is my own furniture. His office, he works 30 yards from me. He's never been in the CEO's office before. <laughs> That's the guy in the building. Now, the guys out there, by the way, this is a union shop. There's a lot of stuff that's happened on water under the bridge over the years. There's no way then, come on, open up, here's who we are, take the shot, but we're gonna do this together, and we're gonna figure this out. And you just can't write a note, say, guess what, guys, here's the new thing. It is really about getting out there. And it was challenging. I remember our first town halls. Nothing worked. These guys had just put in, it's been $120 million in 2016, putting in new IT systems. People weren't getting paid. I remember doing one of my greatest town halls ever, getting them fired up. And any questions? Yes, am I going to get paid? Kind of deflates the whole point. But it was ridiculous what was happening. So it's the union guys, you're here to break the union. I'm like, are you kidding me? But it does take exposing yourself. It does take putting yourself out there. Alex came up with a wonderful way to talk about the family budget. You know, that's going to be a legend, I think, when they tell the story of Talon. <laughs> They'll have Alex's family budget story. Well, in the management letter, it's just sitting around the table as a family and you enumerate all the things right. that could go wrong. Describe that. Well, it's, it's interesting. We were sitting with lots of different types of people through in our first year of Talon, some at headquarters, some at the plants, some mechanics, union, non-union. And so we had to find a simple way to explain and convey across the firm what the firm situation was in. Before we asked people where we wanted to go, I think we owed it to them to explain why and where the firm was. And so the simple story and analogy that we used was, Talon was no different than a family and a family budget. We explained that we were a family that had expenses greater than our income, that that trend was going to get worse, not better, over the next two to three years, that that family had a mortgage coming due in a two-year period that was significant, and that because of its negative income, it was one that it may not be able to refinance, and painted and asked the question, if, if you were going into a bank personally with this story, what do you think the answer would be? And so I think people understood that very clearly, and it was a catalyst to then begin acting. And what's nice now is you go back to that same group, and you tell that same story, and it's a really positive story. And it's a positive story that's largely based on their accomplishments, that we are fortunate to be able to tell. And so I think it resonated with people. We were honest. In some cases, it meant having less people at the plants. In some cases, making difficult changes. But I think as people saw us more and more over time, and they triangulated what information we were giving them with their own points of view, they understood. And they began to be very honest. And that trust began to build, which allowed us to act very quickly thereafter. And I would say we bolted on a couple of ancillary processes, like upward feedback, unlike, I suspect, what you grew up with. Our upward feedback is uh, yes or no. Question one, given the choice, would you work for this person? Yes or no. And in that question alone, we probably let 20, 25 managers go. So the organization knew things were going to be different. You know, if you've got to till the hunt as your boss, you have now a way to communicate that, and it's over. They're gone. And we've done that. So I think, to me, we began to, to create the stories, either through Alex's metaphor on the family budget, the way we acted on certain things. This organization's got a lot of stories in it now that are sort of folksy, but they really signify, gosh, things are different. I can think about a different outcome or a different way of doing something. That's encouraged. That's kind of where we are. That's why I love the fact that our people are probably, you know, you hear this so much, but it is true. Our assets are okay. 
where we're going to win is on the people. It will be the differentiator for us. And we're able, fortunately, to recruit guys like Alex, and he's able to recruit guys like Alex, <laughs> and so forth and so on, mm -hmm. that we have a team, men and women, that are just phenomenal. And that's what you saw last week. People were, they were like, oh my gosh, it's an eclectic mix. But the talent level is really, really neat. We'll be right back with Ralph Alexander, CEO, and Alex Hernandez, CFO of Talent Energy. In a previous episode, episode 19, Mary Powell, CEO of Green Mountain Power, described private equity ownership of her company as giving the company the opportunity to soar. Does the type of ownership provide benefits for Talon? Could you guys have done this in a different ownership context? I think so. I've been on public boards. I've worked in lots of public companies. There are the distractions. We don't have the fiduciary role in the same way that a public company does. And you, you've been in the business putting people on boards. This is a much more interactive, much, much more detailed, no waste of time type of approach to things. But the basic recipe, I think, can work anywhere. Love to test it someday. Is it simpler? Yeah. Do we not have to explain everything we're doing all the time? In some areas, I guarantee you the level of inquiry and challenge is far greater than any public company I've ever seen. Far greater. So it's a little different mix, but it's fair to say I've spent, been able to spend much more time out there and as opposed to the shareholder group than I probably would have in a public sense. And I would have had to adjust a little bit, but I'd take that bet tomorrow. I'd agree. I mean, I, I think some interesting principles are people often shy away from uncertainty, volatility, discord, disarray. All those qualities were present within Talon. We watch lots of companies across our sector and other sectors that have the same qualities, both public and private. And, you know, I think we're attracted and drawn by that dynamic because where those qualities exist, there is usually opportunity. And I think the one thing that we've learned at Talon that I think is certainly uh, translatable, whether public or private, is that looking deeper and deeper and deeper in what you have, you often will find things that you haven't found before. Mm -hmm. That exists everywhere. It might be a little easier to capture in a public context or a private context, but I think the lesson is it can exist in lots of places. You know, the irony is, if you think about how, what people's mindset is around private companies, short-termism versus public, it's the complete opposite. I don't have a benchmark every day I've called a share price. There's a bunch of analysts to sell them because some, I don't know, some crazy thing happened, or buy them because there might be a zero emission credit showing up somewhere, things I can't control. At Riverstone, in the private sense, you have a lot of runway to do the right thing to maximize value, which, in theory, is what a public company should be doing. Mm -hmm. But somehow we get sucked into debate in the day-to-day -day share price that is your marker every day and trying to react or respond to it. And that's when you start making mistakes. You spend too much time either justifying yourself or trying to respond to, my God, I better build a retail business. I need to become a Gentile because I got some analyst telling me that's the right thing. See, that's what I love about the Exxons, the BPs. They knew that they were playing for the long haul. And if you're strong enough and powerful enough, which curiously within a private context you are, because the equity owner is playing for the same thing we are. We get paid on equity value appreciation. Unlike a public CEO, which gets paid no matter what happens, because God forbid you lose the public company CFO, I'm CEO or CFO. Mm -hmm. They're really important guys. You've done this. <laughs> so you can see your company, you gotta give me restricted stock, by the way. These options, they don't work. What if the price goes down? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the whole point. But look how many guys are in, no matter what happens, they're in the money. Yeah. That's not true here. So can you do that in a public context? Absolutely. It seems like a daunting task to have to commit to specific performance and improvement results with so much unknown. Ralph and Alex describe a period from utility ownership to spin-out IPO that created Talon 1.0 to the take-private transaction that created Talon 2.0. And there was a historical lack of visibility and communication that prevented an understanding of what was probable or possible with the business. It shocks me, but then I'm not surprised to hear that people weren't out in the field and that they hadn't seen anybody of a senior rank for 
<laughs> what was it you guys said in the investor day? 25 years or something? Brad said it in his entire career. He's seen us more times in one year mm -hmm. than his whole career. Yeah, 25 so, plus years or something. So, you know, those things happen. Just to put a you know, fine point on this, most people didn't believe the 125. They certainly didn't believe when we said we're going to do a 300 million improvement. They kept saying, it's impossible. Your predecessors talked about all the synergies they got. There's no way. Alex and I spent more time trying to prove to people we could actually do this stuff. So what was the anchor holding back Talon 1.0? If you ask me a Talon 1.0, I would say part of it is the public board process. You know, we had every committee you could think of. We had comps, we had outside consultants telling us what to pay and not pay. And we had an audit committee with outside auditors. But I think to me, having been on a lot of boards, I think we did exactly what you should do, intervene in a big way, say this is gonna go south, we're gonna save this thing. I think we did the right thing anyway, but we had the wrong players, honestly. They were into grow, get bigger, go all gas. We were into operate extraordinarily well. We have no idea whether all gas makes sense. Let's play the hand we have, to Alex's point. This is the best thing we can do acquisitive-wise. Let's do it well. They were into get bigger and diversify, get more gassy. Calpine was the answer, which went back once in its career, too. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with Ralph Alexander, CEO, and Alex Hernandez, CFO of Talon Energy, to discuss the productive partnership between a CEO and a CFO. Stay tuned. We're back with Ralph Alexander, CEO, and Alex Hernandez, CFO of Talon Energy. We turn to discussing the productive partnership between a CEO and a CFO. Ralph, you and Alex frequently present yourself together, not only in formal settings of the management letter, for example, or investor presentations that we saw last week, but even behind the scenes, right down to just emails that we have together, you're always on copy, both of you, operating in a seamless and organic fashion. It seems intentional in some ways and very organic in another, kind of the best of all worlds. And Ralph, from your vantage point as CEO, What's your ideal role of a CFO? Oh, he's, he's my intellectual partner. Well, first of all, I like Alex a lot. He's a great guy. So even if we didn't work together, we knew each other before. We've got to know our families. I just enjoy being with him and his family, and, and I, I know it's mutual. But putting that aside, and my view is when you attract the talent that I've been able to attract here, I owe it to them to get them to a different place. You know, that's a hell of a challenge, because when you get people that bright, and capable, the question you have to ask yourself is, am I capable of doing that? Is he already baked? Can I really help him or not or her? So to me, the obligation is when I have that talent, the onus is on me to make darn sure it continues to develop, it continues to grow, it continues to move forward, to end up in a better place. And for Alex, my deal is, this guy's got so much potential and so many different dimensions, I want him to see everything. We had a nuclear oversight committee meeting today, and we kid around about how much Alex knows about jet pumps and nuclear power plants. <laughs> and it's, it's a joke, in a way, but it's true. We got audited by the, by the nuclear oversight group. My CFO is talking about jet pump replacements. <laughs> I, I challenge any CFO to do that. I spent 10 years in private equity and probably worked with 20 private equity firms, companies, and I've been to probably, I don't know, between five and 10 public company boards. So that you have the sort of the COO, CEO, the operating guys, and then this thing called the CFO, who generally doesn't, you know, runs the audit committee, makes sure the accounts work okay, and so forth. That is, to me, you know, sort of elementary school level. And I would posit many CFOs, the relationship with the CEO is at that level. He is in what I'll call the PhD level, more counselor. And his innovation in the finance side is as strong as the innovation we're seeing on the technical and operational side. So my advice to any CEO is go find yourself an awesome CFO who you believe has got the potential to be your equal if they're not already, or better. But you cannot be a great CFO and not understand what's going on in the business. You just can't get the risk right. I put it this way, it's the first time in my career that this thing called the balance sheet is an incredibly important asset, just as important as the plans. 
It can be managed differently, value can be created from it, but it takes an innovative mindset to think through all the different pieces and somebody who's deeply strategic. And I would argue that today, if you look at the strategy of the firm, the best one and the one that's taken the most risk has been on the finance side that he's led. So I've learned a bunch from Alex. I mean, I've, I know something about finance, 10 years in private equity, but he's taken it to another level. And I, so I, I really enjoyed the challenge and working with him and thinking things through in a different way. I mean, the way you describe it, Ralph, you're enabling Alex as CFO. You're enabling creativity and all this other, all these other aspects that you may not have even envisioned that he has the capability of doing. Alex, what is the role of the CFO? <laughs> well, thanks, Tom and Ralph. You know, I've been blessed over my life and career to have a few great mentors, and Ralph is, is one of those people. And I think the reason this has worked so well is, you know, Ralph, at the beginning, set the parameters in giving me a lot of latitude and in asking for help and counseling and treating me as a partner from day one. And he didn't have to do that at the outset. And that gave me the latitude at the beginning to think about everything in a pretty holistic way. I think the CFO, to the extent that trust exists between the CFO and the CEO, is one of the few people at the firm that can share candid observations and insight, sometimes say no, sometimes agree or disagree privately. And leadership oftentimes is lonely. And what I have found, both in my role and I, and I think in my work with Ralph, is that going through that process together oftentimes is, yields a better result. We made so many decisions so quickly, some alone, some together. And when you add up all those decisions and the level of communication that existed between us at the beginning and today, it's pretty remarkable. But it would have never happened without that trust existing from day one and with a CEO who had that mindset, right? Because again, different organizations work differently and that enabled me to think you know, in the way I did. You know, in the CFO role, one of our early recommendations to, to Ralph was to embed divisional CFOs in our three large divisions so that the finance organization was not just counting, but it was driving. It was driving financial performance. It was driving resolution of liabilities. It was driving strategic direction together with the operating teams. And when you have you know, three talented individuals embedded in business units that see their business unit as their own business and not as part of a huge enterprise, that drives a whole level of performance. You get to understand the business at a much, much, much deeper level. Transformation comes much more quickly. Mm -hmm. Results come more quickly. And fewer things surprise you, right? And, and so people begin to think about things with a risk-adjusted outcome. Not just counting the result, but counting the expectation, counting the risk cone around the expectation, and ultimately having a very deep view of the business that's very closely married to the operating executives of the firm, including the CEO. And then on, on Ralph's point on the, on the balance sheet, I think you know, one of the other most critical additions of talent to our team was our treasurer and, and head of investor relations, who's an unbelievable woman. And you know, the difference with a high yield company is that the high yield balance sheet is actually a tremendous source of value creation. And in the majority of the utility sector or the investment grade sector, it's merely a tool of financing that extends the longevity of the firm. In the case of high yield, it actually creates the longevity. It creates the room for the CEO and his team to drive the operating strategy. And it's actually what can cut off time. And so our simple observation at the outset was we needed more runway. We needed to preserve flexibility. And without that runway, none of the turnaround would have had the time to mature. And so we acted quickly. We threw the football quickly. We threw it multiple times. And now we can be a little bit more precise but that trust with the external marketplace, with capital providers, to allow you to the room to execute, I think is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the combination of a strong divisional CFO team, an incredibly strong treasurer, head of finance, head of investor relations, strong risk management, and you put all those things together, you know, it allows the CEO time to execute. And without it, in high yield, oftentimes, Companies run out of time. We'll be right back with Ralph Alexander, CEO, and Alex Hernandez, CFO of Talent Energy. We're 
We're back with Ralph Alexander, CEO, and Alex Hernandez, CFO of Talon Energy. It's very clear what you all have done since December of 2016. It was painful at some point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we didn't have the track record. We were starting to show things and try to raise money at the same time. And you know, two years on, it's in a much better place. Well, I was struck during Investor Day wanting to see the next chapter of the story. Look, I don't, I don't think there's a defined future out there. I, I go back to you know, a basic point of view, which says we have no idea whether the public markets open up next week or shut off for the rest of eternity. We have no idea whether the industry goes through another round of consolidation. We have no idea whether the utility model is the model that survives in the next decade. You get a lot of moving parts here, politically, technology-wise, and so forth. What I would say is we're getting ready. So a year ago, two years ago, we couldn't have contemplated. It was all about can we get ourselves fixed, stabilized, robust, I will tell you, I think we're robust. We're not great. We got more runway to go. In the basic business, we have more to do over the next couple of years. I think in the next couple of years, given our rate of change, we will be excellent. But we're not there yet. And excellent means more money. And excellent means balance sheet. Excellent means commercial. It's a lot of dimensions to this. Retail, all the C's we put in place. But unlike what we said two years ago, where we would not touch another acquisition, Today, I really believe that there are a lot of assets out there that if we owned or controlled, we could create more value than the other guy can. And Gosh, I, I mean, I'm laughing just because you've proved it, and I, I think you probably see more value than you probably would have ever seen right. but, but it, prior it been to December. Hard to, you, know, you can conclude that now without me saying it to right. you, but we couldn't have done that two years ago. So to me, I think if the world is about something that's inorganic, I feel good enough now we have the horsepower, the processes, the people that can go monetize it and create value around it. I think we're building a reputation and a brand as a company and as a leadership team. The broader team is backing, even if we wanted to pivot in different ways. So we'll see. I, I don't, you know, there isn't some magical thing that Riverstone's come up with or we've come up with that says, you know, date certain next, something's going to happen. That's just not the way the world works today. But I will tell you, if date certain X, Y, Z, or D show up, we, we're going to be able to do a lot of these things if we want to. And that's really, you know, sort of my my mindset here. Yeah. It's a great team. You know, to me, if we ever can become a great company, really great, world class, what we do, then the CEO job and the CFO job becomes really interesting and fun. Because so far, everything we've done, we knew we needed to do. What is a great company? What it's a company that, that basically is performing at a level. What it does, it does world class, and that the future is unwritten. It's a whiteboard. I'm like, we knew we needed to go get the financings done. We knew we needed to cut cost. We needed to get more productive. That execution wasn't easy, and it surprised us how much we were able to do. We knew we needed to solve risk problems, liability problems, which the guys were very innovative in doing. Deal with regulatory issues with NGOs and other groups. We knew all that stuff. But when you're really great and get all that stuff handled, then the question is, where do you point the organization? You want mm -hmm. the whiteboard problem. Because it's not obvious. There's no external thing pushing you in a direction. You've got to decide, with no help, where are we going to go and what's next. And I look, I'm looking forward to contemplating that with Alex in the future. It's a fun problem. I've only had it once in my life that I had to, that question. I always call it the old Coca-Cola question. When Coca-Cola was the darling company, growing at double digits, how they kept redefining themselves towards what next, share of liquids in your body. They, they just thought about the world differently. I hope we get to that point. And at that point, I think this team can pretty much do anything if we get there. Certainly the talent's there. We'll be right back with Ralph Alexander, CEO, and Alex Hernandez, CFO of Talent Energy. <laughs> We're back with Ralph Alexander, CEO, and Alex Hernandez, CFO of Talon Energy. In closing, we go through a bit of a thought projection of Ralph and Alex's management approach on another sector of the energy industry. You come into a situation and you realize how a company, a prior company, Talon 1.0, 
maybe wasn't as proactive in certain areas as it could have been. And I wondered if that sort of gives you maybe a broad generalization about the industry. Nobody's really pushing. Maybe you're seeing some levers that can be pushed or pulled in well, a different way. You know, maybe, you know, I think let, let's look at Nokia. I mean, from Tupperware to phones, you know, maybe that's what we need, we need to do eventually. Maybe generation isn't the place to play eventually. It is distributed that it is sourced in different ways and the real power is somewhere else in the system, transmission, and then that threatens utilities. So I would tell you the secret source, I think, for talent, you know, I don't know, Alex, if this was not a power generation company, if everything else was the same, but it didn't make power, generate power, do you think we could do this again? Sure, I think the general theme is you take an asset that has significant potential and operate it better. And the asset over time may change but I think the principles of operating that asset better so that it becomes more valuable in your hands is a general principle. In the case of nuclear, you know, there are a number of plants in the US I think that will continue to have a very long life. They're the examples of operating excellence, they're the examples of safety, they're the examples of financial performance, but that's not every plant in the country. And so I, I think there's a subset that will have a long life, they'll provide a valuable service to customers across the country, and those that underperform will not, and they will be replaced by other assets. And that's good. I think that's good for the US, it's good for the economy. And in the case of Susquehanna, given where it stands today, you know, we believe it'll be one of the long-term surviving assets in the, in the country. I'm so impressed you just demonstrate that this is the way you turn around a company. And you guys have done this in a very close quarters, hands-on fashion, and I think that's probably universal whether as you said, Ralph, whether it's Nokia or Tupperware, or whatever it might I've, be. I've been on some strange boards at Steinmart, fashion, mining, Anglo American in the UK. I really don't think this recipe is not, this is pretty repeatable. I'm learning a lot about power. I'd never set foot in it. So it's really not the deep technical expertise on how the power generate. Every other CEO in this industry will blow me away on this one. No doubt about it. One of the things that I've learned working together with Ralph is that understanding people's motivations, their aspirations in life is the basis for everything. And leadership ultimately is very personal. In our case, we had a population across lots of states with a big concentration in Pennsylvania that didn't know what their future was. How long were they gonna work at this plant? Was the plant gonna be open or closed? Were they going to be in the union or not? Were they gonna have enough money to feed their families? Was this a company that was gonna be owned by us or someone else? So lots of personal questions that went to the core of people's motivations working at Talon. Once you understand people's motivations and that trust is established, then I think everything becomes possible and the pieces begin to move. Without that basis, it's hard to move an organization. And I would just, if I can just add to that, I think the team we had, we inherited, we did not change a lot of people out. The vast majority that were in town at one point are, are with us today. But they jumped on this quick. I mean, they really, it was a, really a question of setting a different direction, of spending time and taking so much of the burden off of them. You know, to me, people need to be led in a way where you're setting direction, you have wide boundaries, people are clear, and then you support them. You put processes in place to support them and prove to them that it really has changed. The, the world is different. And to be honest, our fossil fleet jumped on this extremely fast. The nuclear guys took a little longer. We moved extremely fast on the SGNA side. I mean, on December 7th, the CEO left, the CFO left, the head of internal order left, the head of HR left, our general counsel left, our chief operating officer left and on and on and on. Head of IT left, there were three of those. They left on day one, they were gone. And this infrastructure that sat on top of everybody was absolutely sucking all the authority out and all the responsibility out from the organization field. And we moved that very, very quickly. But in private equity, you're betting the farm, you have money on the back of a management team. It is very crystal clear. It's not stock, it's not some amorphous thing it is. You have to have deep confidence in their ability. And curiously, in the case of Riverstone, it was really about can we get great management teams? Well, it's very apparent. And I would say for those that haven't, across their whole career, seen the leader show up, I think you've redefined 
what leadership is for many in the organization, it, it appears. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Same here. Thank, Thank you, Tom. You. Thank We've you. enjoyed it as well. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode with Ralph Alexander and Alex Hernandez of Talon Energy. I'd like to express our special thanks to the clients of Lyceum Leadership Consulting that enable us to bring you this podcast. We'll be back in June with our next episode, episode 23. We feature an interview with Richard Burke, CEO of publicly traded solid waste services company, Advanced Disposal Services. Since our interview with Richard Burke several weeks ago, on April 15th, it was announced that Waste Management would acquire Advanced Disposal. You're in store for a great conversation. That's a CEO's Virtual Mentor, Episode 23, due to appear in your favorite podcast platform about June 15th. Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's Virtual Mentor, has been a production of the Leadership Lyceum LLC, copyright 2019, all rights reserved. See you next month.